In our study of prayer, we're continuing today with the prayer of intercession. We've been studying the different kinds of prayer. You know, I believe it would be good if we'd go back over to the book of Ephesians and refresh our memory on the basic scripture that we've used to study this prayer study in the sixth chapter of Ephesians. So let's turn over there now and let's read Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer. Now, we read a couple other translations said praying always with all different kinds of prayer. One translation said all manner of prayer. So we're studying the different kinds of prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Praise the Lord. Now, these are the scriptures that we've used as a basic foundation for studying the different kinds of prayer. And in the first section that we've begun to study, the prayer that, in the kind of prayer that changes things, we've studied the prayer of agreement, We've studied the prayer of binding and loosing. We've studied uh, supplication and petition. And we're involved in studying the prayer of intercession, praying the intercessory prayer. Now I want you to turn your Bibles over to the book of Galatians for a moment. And let's look here once again at some scriptures. There's one scripture that I want to show you from the very first chapter of Galatian that will be a great help to you in praying the prayer of intercession. You remember in Romans 8, 26, the Bible said, Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities when we know not how to pray as we ought. For he maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And we found out by studying some of the Greek words there that this uh, leaves the meaning in the Greek's mind with groanings which cannot be uttered in articulate speech. They are, they are things that come from the heart of the, the spirit man within your body. The, the man in there is praying. Paul said, if you, and here again you need to read this in your amplified translation from uh, 1 Corinthians 14th chapter. He said, when I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit within me prayeth. Now that's what the King James says. And the Greek text, more literally translated, is this, My spirit within me, by the Holy Spirit, prayeth. In other words, this is a corporate structure, construction between the spirit man, the hidden man of the heart, you, and the Holy Spirit in there, interceding and teaching and training and urging and, and issuing forth the power in order to get this done. Now then, the thing I want us to see in Galatians chapter 1 is a relationship between the will of God, our praying, and the will of the Holy Spirit. Now in interceding, we find out also in the 8th chapter of Romans that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit knows the heart of God, searches the heart of God in our behalf, making intercession for us and prays the perfect will of God for the saints. Now, as long as we're in the Spirit, as long as we're praying in the Spirit, you're not going to be praying in unbelief. Did you know that? But now one thing you must realize, folks, is that all of it is not 
entirely beyond our own natural man, our own mind. There are things we can do to stand in faith before we pray the prayer of intercession and most certainly after we've prayed the prayer of intercession. Because you see, I go into intercessory prayer, I pray there, I believe God there, I intend for God to move most of the time, not just some of the time, but most of the time I'm praying above my head. I'm praying beyond mental prayer. If mental praying is all we have, then folks, we are highly limited. Because you and I must agree on one thing. We're limited where our knowledge of ourselves is concerned. Well, I'm certainly got to be limited where you're concerned, praise the Lord. See, the Bible said no man knows what's going on in the heart of another man except the, the spirit of the man that's in him. The only way I can know what's going on inside you is for me to get in there. And I can't get inside you. You follow me? And the apostle Paul said there in 1 Corinthians, the first two chapters, he's teaching on this. He said, but we've not received the, the uh, spirit of the world. We've received the spirit of God. And he said, no man knows what's in the heart of them, what's inside a man, except the spirit of the man that's in there. And he said, by the same token, no man knows what's inside God, except the spirit of God that's in there. And then he goes ahead and says, we've received him. Well, thank God. God's in there. We ought to be knowing what's inside God and he knowing what's inside us. Well, it's the Holy Spirit in me. It's the Holy Spirit in you, thank God. Now, there's where we can come together. There's where we can be joined together and be one in the Lord. Are you following what I'm saying? So as we're praying there, that's all fine and good, and there's great power involved. That's where the power is, is praying in the Spirit, praying beyond our mental capacities but and our mental limitations. But then after I get up from my prayer, after I leave my prayer closet, after I begin to operate during the day, I'm out here going around and, I, and some thought flash across my mind and says, yes, Brother Copeland, uh, you know you were praying for, for brother and sister so-and-so way off up yonder somewhere. Now, you really missed it this time. In the first place, they didn't even need prayer. I've had him buffet me like that while I'm ministering in the Spirit on this platform, ministering to a congregation. I'll begin to speak to somebody, and, and, and the devil will run right up there, right in the middle of everything, go talk to my head and say, boy, you blew it this time. You blew it this time. That wasn't even so. That wasn't even so. And you know what I've learned? More times than not, He's trying to stop me from putting that word forth because it's the very thing that's going to make that man free. And he knows if it ever gets out, he's had it. If it ever gets out, he just absolutely had it. He fought me over one of them last night, and praise God, I've got the victory over it and, I, and got him just, just banging him around any way I want him by keeping him out on the end of that sword. He goes running up in there, take that sword and pop him one. He'll get out of your way. Now then, I want to give you this because this can be... See, we're, we're praying in areas where, where we don't know how to pray as we ought. I'm praying for people I can't see. I'm praying for people I don't know. I'm praying for the body of Christ. I'm praying for men of high authority. And I certainly can't believe everything I read in the newspaper or see on television about these men. We've learned that in the last few weeks, haven't we? So we're praying in areas where we need to protect ourselves with the Word of God and protect our mind, protect our thinking. And I want to show you something from the first chapter of Galatians that has meant as much to me as anything I ever read. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God. There is a, there's a mouthful of prayer right there if you want to know the truth. That is quite a prayer, and it is a prayer of intercession. Now notice what he said. The fourth verse is what I wanted you to see. Anytime that the, uh, the, this kind of impression comes to you and you get to thinking, well, now here I am praying, you know, 
uh, for God to deliver so and so. I'm praying for God to make them free. What if it wasn't God's will that they that they be free? What what if I'm praying crosswise of the will of God? Well, if you've forgotten what the Bible says, what that that the that we're praying the perfect will of God when we're praying in the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit helps us do that. If you've forgotten about that, and if your mind won't let you alone on it, just begin to quote verse 4. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our Father. Hallelujah. It is God's will that they be delivered from this present evil world. And whatever this present evil world is throwing at you or anybody else, Jesus gave himself so that you be delivered from it. Praise God. Amen. Now listen, that'll work for you. Now let's go back to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. I'll show you another prayer that can be prayed. This will work for you. Many times I'll, I'll do it in this fashion. Particularly... If there, is a, if there is a person, a place, a group of people, say like a church, this prayer was prayed originally for a church. A lot of times, most of the time when I know the ones I'm praying about. Let's take, for instance, let's, let's say, for instance, we're obeying the word of God and we're praying for the leaders of the nation. Let's say we're praying for the president of the United States. Or you can put Uncle Fred, there ain't many in here, anybody else that you, that you want to pray this for. Now this is a Holy Spirit inspired prayer. We find it in the first chapter of Ephesians, verse 16. The Apostle Paul said, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He goes ahead and prays the rest of this thing. He prayed it all the way down through the 23rd verse. That's all one prayer. So now what normally when I'm praying in intercession or if I move into an area of prayer, I will pray what little I know about it in my mind. If I don't know anything about it, let's say I'm praying for the President of the United States. Now, I'll tell you right frankly, I know very little in the natural about my president. I do know a couple of things from the Word, from the 13th chapter of Romans. The Bible said he is God's minister for our good. Now, I have that to stand on. I also stand on several other scriptures in the Bible that I've quoted you before, several from Isaiah and several from the book of Proverbs, particularly one that says, the heart of the king is in the hand of God. I like that. I confess that before the, the Father. But now, anybody, anybody, I don't care where they are, anybody, you can pray this prayer. Now, now, now watch, me, watch me set this up. In fact, I'll just demonstrate this to you. I'll just show you how, how I pray. I'll just go, I'll just move on into the whole thing. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray and I cease not to make mention according to your word for my president, Richard Nixon. And I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto Mr. Nixon the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And that the eyes of Mr. Nixon's understanding being enlightened that he may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of God's power toward Mr. Nixon as a believer? according to the working of God's mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, Father, I'm asking you to reveal these things to him. Him, reveal them to him. Give him that spirit of wisdom 
and understanding. And I intercede for him now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I pray for him, spirit, soul, and body. I pray for him financially. I pray for him for you to reveal your perfect will in his life. Lift him up into the highest places of the highest places as the governor of this, of this nation under God Almighty that he be wiser than the serpents that would attack him and wiser than the onslaughts of, of other systems that care to destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that you uplift him in places where his mind is dark Cause him to be spiritually strong. Cause his family to be in good health and give him the power and the strength to, to undertake the job that's before him and cause the spirit of depression and oppression to depart from him now in the name of Jesus for I call his name with my faith before the altar of the King of kings and the God of gods and the Lord God of heaven and earth and I believe God for his complete and total deliverance and his spiritual satisfaction in this hour and I cause you to raise him up and make him a man of valor, of power, not politically but spiritually under the name and the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth by the blood of the Lamb. And I give you praise and I thank you for it. Hallelujah. I thank you for it. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, could you detect there when I went over into the Spirit? Huh? Could you detect it? Well, of course, it's very quick and it's very easy in an atmosphere like this because I'm already in the spirit anyway. I've already prayed over in there. I've been there for weeks now. And it's easy for me to go on in the spirit. But a lot of times I might have prayed there in tongues like that, you see. You say, well, Brother Copeland, hey, you know that's what you're praying about. Well, I have some faith, thank you. I exercise faith. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Can you see that? All right. As I went over into there, you see, I went over into other tongues... Well, now, most of the time, actually, if, I'd been, if I hadn't been here and demonstrating that, I'd just stayed in tongues. But there are times, you see, speaking with other tongues, speaking out of your spirit in an unknown language, speaking like I was speaking that. The Bible said when a man prays in tongues, let him pray also that he may interpret. Now, you notice that didn't say let him pray. He be an interpreter. Interpreting the ministry of tongues and the ministry of interpretation is done out in the presence of a congregation. And that's one reason I went ahead and interpreted that today because that's that's a scriptural thing to do. Won't bless you any of me just stand up here and talk in tongues. But in your own prayer closet, you ought to pray. You might not always speak it out like that, out of your spirit. You may be just praying in the spirit and you say, Father, I want my mind to be fruitful too. I want to know what's going on here and you just know. You know who you're praying for or somebody will come to you thinking you just, you just bear down on it that much harder and God's just letting you in on what he's doing. You won't interpret it 100% of the time. There may be times the Lord said, no, you don't have any business knowing. You'd mess it up if you did know. Just go on anyway, praise the Lord. See, you may be praying for somebody you couldn't exercise any faith for. Did you know God loves movie stars? But see, you may have a hard time praying for some famous figure like that in any kind of faith. And he may be using you to intercede for somebody like that. I've seen times it was hard for me to pray for political leaders and so forth till I got grounded in the word concerning it. You see, now I don't have any difficulty. In it. But up until then, I pretty near had to do it all in other tongues because I get over in the natural man and I just go to thinking, there ain't a way in the world God's ever going to get to that sorry thing. <laughs> you know? And the Bible didn't say give forth intercessions and criticisms. It said intercessions and givings of thanks. And when I started giving thanks for the men in that office, then it changed my whole entire attitude about me. And then I, I learned I could pray that way. But what I wanted you to see was that moving over in the spirit like that is available, thank God. Now, if I had gone on with that, sooner or later, there would have been this groaning in the spirit. 
Now that can be induced a great deal just because you will to do it. It isn't all the time, always, come from the Spirit of God always on you. There are times when I set myself as an intercessor. See, the Bible said God looked and saw that there was no man who would stir himself to intercede. No man stirred himself up. Remember what Paul told Timothy? He said, stir the gift that's within you. You want me to tell you what stirs God, what stirs the Spirit of God more than any other one thing is when you put yourself in a position of interceding for the lost, interceding for the sick, interceding. That stirs God. That's the only reason he's come. That's the reason he's here, you see. He's already stirred over that. Someone asked me one time, said, you mean you just turn God on and off any time you get ready? No, ma'am, I turn me on and off any time I get ready. He's always on. He's always stirred. He's always ready. You don't catch him off somewhere laying down. Boy, I mean, he's on 24 hours a day. You can wake up in the middle of the night and just start praying suddenly and you can't catch God off guard. He was ready. He was ready. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. I had a great time of prayer this morning from about 3 to 5.30. And I want you to know, I got so turned on in there, I began to wonder when I was ever going to sleep. But I just get so turned on. I woke up in the middle of the night just to praying, just to praying. I was praying in tongues, just praying up a storm. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night preaching. I've, I've gotten a hold of some of the best sermons I ever preached in my life, two of the most powerful ones I've ever preached anywhere at any time. I woke up in the middle of the night preaching them. And I was smart enough to go ahead and listen to it <laughs> and make mental note of what I was preaching. And sometimes I'll reach over and get my tape recorder and put it down right quick or grab a pencil and paper and write it down right quick, praise God, and get it in about 15 minutes and take two weeks to preach it. Praise God. I tell you, folks, living like this is an adventure in itself. But you'll never break over into that realm of walking in the Spirit until you first make the decision that you will be an intercessor in prayer. Until you will be an extension of the ministry of Jesus and begin to move over in that kind of realm. Now then, let's go over to the Gospel of John. I want to talk a minute about groaning in the Spirit. I, I, want, I want to talk about that a minute. We, we found the Scriptures uh, about that yesterday. We found, you remember, we found out that the Bible said that Zion would bring forth her children once she travailed. And we found out that <clears throat> there's a chief cornerstone in Zion, praise God. We're talking about the body of Christ when we're talking about that. And the Apostle Paul said, Galatians 4, 19, my little children, I travail in birth for you again until Christ be formed in you. Now, we have tried travailing prayer and agonizing prayer trying to get healed. And we've tried travailing prayer and agonizing prayer trying to get somebody else saved. We've tried all that. But you see, we were trying to depend on the travail to get it done. And folks, that's not where our faith is. Our faith is in God. It doesn't say travailing prayer gets results. It says when you believe you receive, you shall have it. We go into this kind of prayer believing we receive it on the front end of it, not praying it and hoping, bless God, something we'll bang into along here somewhere will get the results. You might as well just forget about that. You get into a traditional area to where you don't think you're getting anything. I know people that don't think God hears them until they cry. You, you really don't ever kind of stop and think about it. You just, you just kind of got the idea that, well, you know, I didn't get very far today. I mean, I didn't feel a thing. You ever done that? I have. I've gone in there and prayed, you know, and stayed a few minutes and think, well, boy, I tell you, I'm not getting anywhere today. I mean, my prayer doesn't seem to me like going any higher in the ceiling. It don't need to go any higher than that. Spirit of God's right there in you. He can get the message across to heaven. Don't you ever worry about that. He doesn't need to get any higher in your chin. Do you know that? That's the truth. He maketh intercession for us. Put some confidence in him. Praise the Lord. How much, how much faith are you placing in the God that's living there in you anyway? Praise the Lord. And you get in there and you think, boy, I tell you what, I'm just so dry. 
I'm just so spiritually dry. Well, now, <laughs> where'd you ever see in the Bible it said, pray till you're wet? <laughs> I know what you're talking about, and I know that I've done it, and I know you've done it. I know we've all been guilty of this sort of thing. But you see, folks, there's not any faith in that. There's no confidence in that. That when your faith becomes the strongest, like the Apostle Paul said, is when the tribulation is worse, when it's hardest to feel anything, when it's hardest to put forth, brother, that's when you need it. And actually, you'll find that's when most of the time the power of God was the strongest, is when right in the midst of adversity, you intend to get God the glory and just lay hold of her praise God and get on with it and think, well, his eyes are over the righteous and his ears are open to my prayers. And this is the confidence we have in him that if we pray anything according to his will, he heareth us and we know when he hears us, we have the petition we desired of it. Now, Satan, you're just going to have to move over, bless God, because I'm fixing to fix this situation. I'm fixing to pray. Somebody said, you don't mean to tell me you feel like you had something to do with that. I didn't have something to do with it. We had everything to do with it, praise God. The only reason God's moving in there is because we're here. Isn't that the truth? Wasn't any people here, he'd leave. Amen? So you see, we don't want to get over into the area of depending on the seen, depending on the flesh, depending on the natural to put us over. I asked one lady one time, I tell you, that is the outdoingest, groaningest woman I ever heard in all my, I didn't like to play around her at all. We'd go into prayer, you know, we'd say, well, let's pray. She'd say, all right. Oh, she'd just come apart. Just, and the first time it ever happened, I jumped about three foot backwards and looked at her. I thought, what in the world is the matter with her? And she'd do that every time she'd pray. We'd be in a church service or something, she'd come up the altar and start praying. I'd think, oh no, here she come. <laughs> and finally one time I asked, I didn't know anything about all this. I hadn't been, man, I hadn't been saved long enough to hardly know which way I was headed. I knew I was saved though. Praise God, that's one thing I knew. That's all I knew. But I there was just something about what she did that just absolutely just got to me. I just couldn't stand that. And after about two weeks being around there and hearing her do that, I asked her one day over there in her house. We'd go over there and pray for the meetings. I was helping another fellow that was preaching there. And, and, and we'd go over there to the house and we'd pray. And, and uh, she'd start in. And I never heard nothing like that in my life. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've heard my... My wife go through having two children. And I never heard nothing like that. <laughs> Standing out there in that maternity ward and listening to all that. I never heard nothing like what that woman went through. <laughs> and I finally asked her, I said, uh, how come you do that? <laughs> I said, I don't think I've heard anything quite like what you pray in my life. She looked at me kind of funny. She's kind of touchy anyhow. People that depend on things in the natural are kind of touchy. And she wore her feelings right out here all the time. And boy, you had to be careful. You got on her feelings. She'd fix you. Well, see, there's not anything godly about that whole attitude. And when I asked her, I said, how come do you do that? She said, that's the only way God hears me. Well, right there, I didn't know any better. I thought, well, I guess God knows her better than I do. Went on about my business. But I've thought about it since. There's, there, there's not, that's not, not anything scriptural about that. In fact, if you want to know the truth, the junk she is praying, God didn't even hear. It's all unbelief. All stark unbelief. Not an ounce of faith in the whole thing. She had her faith and her confidence in something in the natural. Now, I realize most of us got into that honestly. See, she probably had a spirit of intercession that was real to come on her at one time or another and got results. So, bless God, she figured that's the only way God ever hears me. And so she just did it every time she prayed. And you never heard such carrying on. I didn't blame God for not listening to that. I had much rather hear somebody just say, Jesus. Brother, that got the ear of God right there. Right then and there, that opened heaven's treasure house. Right then. The Bible says, at the sound of that name, every knee shall bow. Of beings in heaven, in earth, 
and under the earth, and every tongue confess that he is Lord. At what? At the sound of that name. Now, brother, you've got heaven's attention. You've also got hell's attention. When you sound forth that name. So see, somebody said, we're going to pray through. You could have started through. You could have started out through and then stayed there right before God and gone right on and, and, uh, and interceded and gone right on and got these things done. But some folks want to pray all night long before they figure that God heard them. You just wasted your night. You wasted the night. Actually, what you did, you brought yourself into a physical situation and a physical feeling and maybe an emotional feeling that convinced you God heard you when you could have started out on what God said he would hear and faith in his word in what he would hear. Amen? Now, if we go at it that way, you see, if I go at it in faith, then I can, then I can honestly, I can honestly before God begin to travail in the spirit. I'm not trying to get his attention on this thing. I have his attention. I happen to be born of him. I happen to be spirit with him. I happen to be bone of his bone. And thank God his very own son's my big brother. I got his attention. Now let's get the thing done here. Let's apply spiritual pressure where it belongs. I'm not putting pressure on God. I'm joining with God and placing pressure on the devil and on the situation that needs change and praise God in intercession. And I join with God in this thing and lay hold of it with my faith and then just stay there in the spirit and just stay there. I've got the pressure on. I'm not going to let it off. Now, in that kind of attitude, you move over into an area of intercession where there is groaning in the spirit and you travail in birth. Now, it's, it's mentioned like that because of the, the lower part of the belly. The lower part of the belly. And the groanings that cannot be uttered, that the Holy Spirit is feeding into your spirit and they come forth out of there. Sometimes they don't make a whole lot of noise. I've noticed sometimes it'll come up in me and, and there are times it'll just, it'll be kind of quiet. But it's there. And you don't want to talk. You don't want to talk to anybody. You find people that are intercessors don't talk much. You find somebody just blabs off at the mouth all the time, you know they don't pray a whole lot. Praying people, when they say something, it's usually out of the mouth of God. Amen? Now that people may spend a lot of time walling around in the floor on their knees, but I'm not about people that pray and believe God. See, they do more listening to God than they do talking to him. I learned that kind of the hard way. The Lord, I finally said, you know, I believe I'm going to be quiet here a minute and see what God would say. And he said, well, it's about time. <laughs> he said, you've been doing all the talking. I couldn't get a word in edgewise. And I would. I'd just go in there and ball, call, and carry on, bell around, kick a few chairs over and say, well, I didn't get nothing today. And went <laughs> leave, you know. And he couldn't get anything to me. I'd go turn the television on before he could say anything to me. <laughs> well, that's, this is kind of the way we've been. But now, in over in this kind of area of praying, I'll tell you this. This is one of the ways that mighty power is unleashed in the earth. Now, let's watch Jesus do this in the 11th chapter of John. Let's follow this carefully. Get the whole situation here. Let's move down here about the time in the 28th verse. When she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now, now here's some scripture here that's usually passed over, but it's very important. What's it? 30th verse. Now, Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. He hadn't come out there where all those people were. Now, one thing you're going to have to learn, there, there are two things you're going to have to learn in order to be an intercessor and, and in order to have any kind of prayer life. Two things you're going to have to protect yourself from. One of them is people 
putting forth unbelief. There are times that you're going to, ha it'll just absolutely be necessary for you to pull off in a lonely place. Pull off in a place and stay there till you get your mind quiet and stay there until you settle and get the things of the world out of your way. And then when you begin to move, particularly if you're going into a place to preach or if you're going into an area of ministry, you may have interceded for this person, but now you got to go to the hospital and lay your hands on them. God has said, go minister this. Go take your bottle of oil and go over here. Or right, one of the people in the church call you and say, come over here. I'm sick and I need help and I want you to come minister to me. As you go get yourself before God, don't just run around town all day and just run by there this afternoon when you get the chance. I'll tell you, Satan will bombard you with unbelief. Turn your radio off. Turn the TV off. Turn the newspaper off. Turn everything off but God. And if you need to, go get your tape recorder and turn it on with faith. And somebody comes along and goes to condemning you over the tape recorder. Slip that tape off and put it in the trash. And I say, well, there might be something on there that would be good. That's all right. I don't want to have to wade through that unbelief to get it. God get it to me out of his own book. There's not any unbelief in this one. I'll guarantee you there's no unbelief in this Bible. Not any there. Please turn the tape over for the conclusion. You see, Jesus didn't go down there where all those guys are screaming and hollering about, about death and so forth. Now, another thing you're going to have to do to be an intercessor, you're going to have to take authority over your vocabulary. You can't talk unbelief all day and then pray two hours this afternoon and figure on getting anything done. It won't work that way. Now, you see, Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. Now, back up here and let me show you how Jesus protected his vocabulary. Now, he, he, he'd had this thing in the spirit for days. You back up there to the 10th verse. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles because there's no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. And Jesus unto them plainly said unto them, Lazarus is dead. But now do you notice here, he didn't want to confess death. He wouldn't do it. He ordered his mouth. He, and these guys didn't understand what he was doing. A lot of times you'll be misunderstood. But don't worry about that. They don't make any difference whether they understand it or not. Bless God, Lazarus came forth, and that's what we're after. See, his results. You following that? He protected his vocabulary, and he protected his ears and his environment. Until it was time to move in on the situation, he kept himself protected. Okay, now let's go back up where we were. Verse 31. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her. Yeah, I bet they did. When they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth to the grave to weep there. Now you can see how the natural mind of uh, men runs. They made up her mind, what their mind, what she was going to do. You can't afford to allow your mind to run in that direction. You must keep your mind on the things of God, regardless of how much mouth and tongue persecution comes or how people misunderstand you, your reputation is not what we're guarding and building. Your reputation, hang your reputation. Who cares? Men can't hurt you. They can't destroy you. And don't get the idea you're protecting God's reputation either. He doesn't need it. I said, yes, but Brother Coburn, what if he doesn't heal them? Then I've already told Ah, oh, come on. You just destroyed it right then yourself. He said he would, he will. He said he would, he will. Praise God. Now you move on that premise and don't be moved by what you see and what you feel and just be moved by what you believe. Praise God. You follow that? It's more important in the life of an of a intercessory prayer warrior than anything else. It'll help 
more than anything else to develop your own Christian character and personality. And you know what people will finally get to where they say about you? I'll tell you one thing about that fellow. You always know where you stand around him. He doesn't say one thing and mean another. I had one young man work for, came to work for me for a while. In fact, he's Billy Adams' son. And, and uh, he, he just right fresh out of school and, and uh, had been called to the ministry. And he wanted to work for us. And so <laughs> he went to work for me. And uh, I told him one day I said, something I said to him. I don't remember now what it was. And uh, he didn't do it. And I called him in. I said, how come you didn't do that? He said, well, I didn't know whether you really meant it or not. Well, I didn't say a whole lot to him. But I, I told him, I said, bless God, I said it, I mean it. And that's all I said. Well, about two months later, he came to me. He said, you know, this first time in my life I ever been around anybody that you could absolutely depend on what he was thinking and what he was doing because he told the truth. And he said, I didn't realize how geared we are to, to think, saying one thing, doing another. Even in just our social life, you have to kind of double figure somebody. Well, that double standard is what got you in trouble with your young people. When God opened the eyes of the earth like he's done the last 10 years, he's opened the eyes of the earth. I mean, this thing's opened up, sin and getting away with the things it used to. And they saw that double standard and they didn't know whether to fight or run or what to believe. And thank God there's a bunch of them turn to God on account of it. Amen. Isn't that right? Well, you see, this will tend to develop your own Christian character in these areas and get you into an area to where you're, 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 you're plain. You're not, you're not hard spoken. You're plain spoken. You mean what you say and you say what you mean. Now then, let's go ahead and finish reading this. Verse 32, Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now my, my cross-reference right here, where I have a, a, a reference on was troubled. And over in the cross-reference it says, He troubled himself. He troubled himself. And this says that is the literal Greek rendering of that word. He troubled himself. See, it didn't say God troubled him. It didn't say the Holy Spirit within him troubled him. It said he troubled himself. He moved within himself. It didn't say he troubled his body. It said he moved in himself. You follow this now? With the teaching we've been bringing forth on spirit, soul, and body, this ought to begin to mean something to you. Who is himself? That's the spirit man within him. He troubled himself in the spirit and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Now, you see, the carnal mind said, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? And Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave and stone lay on it. That uh, was a point. Now look. He was not weeping because Lazarus was dead. Wouldn't that be kind of contradictory? There wouldn't have been any faith in that. Not when he's going over that raise him up. I mean, what's the use crying over somebody who's fixing to get raised from the dead? What kind of, how lucky can you get? Huh? Looks to me like Lazarus is the one in this deal. This is the luckiest guy in the whole bunch. <laughs> Think what an experience he's had. Praise the Lord. He's been on both sides. See? So Jesus, didn't say Jesus cried about it. Or he grieved about it said he wept. He wept. He groaned in the spirit and he wept. The power of God came on him so strong that it broke out in weeping. Now I've had that happen to me. But then right on the other hand, other people have had it happen to them. And then they thought, well, I'll tell you what, maybe that crying's what put me over. And then tried to cry. That's not what we're after, folks. We're not after a physical manifestation. We're after the results. That's what we're after. The way it affects me physically has very little to do with it, and actually I could care less. 
I've seen it work and had it happen when there was very little physical manifestation in me, but I knew what was going on in my spirit. I knew what I, knew what I was doing on the inside here, and it was great. At other times, I've had it to just break out like that in a... In a uh, almost uncontrollable physical thing where it just everybody in there just start crying all at one time. But we didn't set out to cry to get the attention of God. I cannot be careful enough to make sure you realize what I'm speaking of here. Because this is dangerous ground. You can get over into unbelief in this so fast it isn't even funny if you're going to listen to your physical senses and allow Satan to govern your prayer life instead of the Holy Spirit. All right? Now watch him here. This is where it goes to getting good. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Verse 39, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Now he's moved in the spirit, and the next thing he says is, Take that stone away from there. Brother, that took some faith in what he was doing. There had to be some faith in what was going on on the inside of him. Somebody said, yes, Brother Copeland, but he was the Son of God. Well, you have to realize, folks, that there's no way in the world that Jesus could have operated beyond faith. He didn't have a free ride. The Bible said he was tempted and tested the way we are, yet without sin. And the Bible said he pleased God. And the Bible also said it's impossible to please God without faith. He didn't have a free ride in these things. He had to take them by faith even more than you do. You've got more of a free ride than he does because he was responsible. He did have the fullness of the Spirit. He did have the fullness of his mental capacities. He did have the fullness of his physical capacities. Therefore, he, there was not one ounce of any area that Satan could throw at him that he it could be just looked over because of his ignorance or just looked over because he didn't know because he did know, bless God, he had less of a free ride than you do. He had to get it by faith. He had to resist the devil. He had to take it by not being able to see it with the physical eye, but he could see it with that third eye, the eye of faith, bless God. That's the one he looked at and he said, I do nothing except I first see my father do it. Well, he wasn't watching God walking around in front of him. The, he saw him in the Word, said he did. Said he did. Saw him through the eye of faith. Praise God. You following me? Like my little son said the other night, Daddy, what would we do without three eyes? And that's what I say. What would I do without that third eye? The eye of faith where I can see into the unseen world and take that step that step beyond, that one step out of this natural world over into that spirit world where the unlimited power is. Praise God. And he took it, you see. He took that step of faith right then. He could have sat around out there and prayed all afternoon. But he took that step of faith right in the midst of this. He groaned within himself. He troubled himself. He moved in the spirit. Connect that with, with Romans 8, 26, 27, 28, and 29. You'll see how it worked. You see how it worked with groanings which cannot be uttered. See, he did that. He moved in that area. And then he took the step of faith and said, take that stone away from that door. Glory be to God. Every time I, every time I come along here, I cannot help but think about what one preacher friend of mine told me about Smith Wigglesworth. He was a young preacher and in, in, um, had a little small church in England. And Brother Wigglesworth was on up in years. And he came there and preached a meeting for him and his church for a few days. And he said that he, he was just young and nearly everything he was doing was all head knowledge. He was right fresh out of school. Oh, he had a lot of zeal for God. But then when you got into action, he said, that old man's scary so bad. Said, you didn't know what he's going to do. Said, we're just walking down the street one day and there was a woman walked out that had a double stairway into her flat there and they were walking along there and people around out on the street you know and Mr. Wigglesworth walked along she had something wrong with her knee had it bandaged or in a cast or something she walked down there anyway it was visible something wrong with her leg and Mr. Wigglesworth walking down there and hollered out and said say lady did you know Jesus will heal that leg of yours and this preacher telling me about this he said man I want to go hide Kind of like the sister Lazarus did. She said, Lord, he already stinks. Don't do that. See? 
And he said that later, he said, you don't say. He said, I do say. He said, you come down now, I'll lay my hands on you and God will heal your leg. He said, how in the world could a man make a statement like that? Because Jesus said, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That's the only basis he did anything like that on. And she came down there and he prayed for her and she, he said she just danced all over the sidewalk. Well, see, the man's living in faith. He's walking in that faith realm. He's walking in. Well, they went over. They called him over to um, one of their members of the church. Somebody in that family had died. One of their uncles or somebody died. And they called the pastor, you know, for, because you're supposed to. And he was going over there and pay his respects and all that sort of thing that, you know, everybody does. And... They had the man set up there for everybody to look at in the parlor. And there were two glass doors there going into that parlor. And they didn't know who Smith Wigglesworth was. Uh, if they did, you know, they didn't know. I mean, he wasn't part of the family. They didn't know anybody. He just went over there because this man was, was pastor. And they went over there together. And he walked in the door. And when he walked in the door, he went in there and run everybody out of that parlor where that casket was. And went over there and closed those doors. And walked in there and reached in, got that guy out of that, and pulled him out of that casket. Now right there, we separate the men from the boys. <laughs> I guarantee you, brother. Woo! I want you to know right now, you better have something going for you. Because, <laughs> man, this guy's going to walk or you going to the pen, one of the two. You can depend on that. Isn't that true? Well, this is what Jesus had done. He laid three years of ministry on the line right there. Laid it on the line when he said, roll the stone away from the door. Because everybody that was anybody in Jerusalem was there. Lazarus was a rich man. Well-to-do man, well-known man. Don't you remember later he went uh, to a place with Jesus and it said that a lot of those important people, the Pharisees and all those people came down there because they wanted to see him. They wanted to see this Lazarus that had been raised up from the dead. They knew him. They wanted to kill him. It doesn't affect people all the time like you think it was. They wanted to kill him because he supported what Jesus had done, see. Just by walking around, he was a support to Jesus. I, I'm, I'm thinking now, I'm wondering here a little bit. I thought about this the other night when uh, Warden Harvey was talking about Brother Brett being paroled from prison. I wonder if, if his parole, if, if something of the power of God didn't have to do with his parole. Because, you see, as long as this man's walking around well, he's a threat to anybody there that doesn't want to believe God. Now, brother, they stuck with Brother Brett. Because his flesh was far gone, you couldn't even stick a needle and thread in it and make it hold. He'd already decayed. There wasn't any way he could live over two or three hours. Now the man's well up walking around and it happened within about 24 hours. Well, if I didn't want to believe God, I'd have proled Brother Brett too. Because you stuck with it. Amen? Well, they were stuck with Lazarus. And, and Mr. Wigglesworth walked in here and pulled that guy up out of that coffin and stood him up in the corner. And backed off away from him and said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. And pointed his finger and he slid in the floor. He walked over then, picked him up and stuck him back up in the corner again and stood back and said, I said, in the name of Jesus, walk. And he fell on the floor. And he walked back over there and picked him up and slammed him back into that corner and said, he shouted so loud you could have heard him for three blocks. And he said, I said, in the name of Jesus, walk. And he did. He said, now, if you don't think that was something to see when he and that fella come walking out of that room in there and, and all those other people standing around in there don't want no part of him. Don't want any part of either one of them. Until after they had an opportunity to realize what an outstanding thing God had done at the hands of a mere man. Praise God. But you see, you don't walk in this realm. You don't deal in this realm. This, th this kind of realm is reserved for the intercessor, the man that wears the full armor of God, not just leaves it hanging in the closet. But it's there for anybody that'll walk into it. It's there for anybody that'll live in it. It's there. That world is there. And when you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you were born into that kingdom. 
Folks, I am totally convinced in relation to the idea that we have had concerning men in the ministry and that nobody but a man in the ministry could attain that kind of spiritual power. I am convinced of this. Now, you follow me carefully. I am convinced that the least in the body of Christ, the least saint of God, got the least calling. The least little old saint of God. God may not have called that person but to carry out one trash basket in the church all of their life to have been in the perfect will of God. And I am convinced that the very least in the body of Christ could have, through intercession and the word of God and the power of God and the greatness of the kingdom of God, could have gone much higher than the highest any of us in the ministry have ever gone. And if that's so, where do you think the apostle and the prophet and the evangelist and the pastor and the teacher could have gone to? We've spent the last 1,600 years trying to get up to the start. Trying to do what the early church did. And do you know all they had was the name of Jesus? That's the only revelation that they had where Jesus said, in my name do these things. They didn't have, they didn't have 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and all these letters to read. Paul wrote those years later. They didn't have all that to go by. They didn't have that whole Bible laying in their lap like you do. All they knew was Jesus said, my name go do these things. Well, bless God, we've still got his name. Plus all the rest of this, the, all the rest of this mass amount of knowledge that God shared in the earth over the last 1970 years. Praise God, let's use it. Jesus said the least in the kingdom of God be greater than John the Baptist and that he was the greatest prophet that had ever been born of a woman. Now you take the least in the kingdom of God being greater than the greatest prophet that, that ever lived under the old covenant. You see, he didn't exclude Moses or anybody else. Can you see what I'm saying? Can you understand why I base that like I do and say what I do? That the least in the kingdom of God could have attained height of spiritual results and power operating in the world of the spirit that's greater than anything the ministry's ever done. And if that's so, what could the ministry have done for to operate in faith instead of building our, our little two-bit kingdoms and fight one another and fuss and gripe and carry on and act spiritual and and place, religion, politics, and all of that other abominational stuff. And stayed in the spirit. And stayed in the spirit. I'll tell you something for you guys that are in the ministry here this afternoon. I want you to hear what I'm saying because I'm saying some things that will break your ministry open, but I'm also saying some things that will put you to work. You're going to quit being a cab driver and running around all over town and tending to natural, physical things. Cut it out. Get in the word and prayer. Say, but Brother Copeland, what about all these other things? Pray. God will send you men to do it. He's got men called to do those things. He's got men called to vacuum that church. And if you catch your pastor in there sweeping up the church and polishing the furniture, take the sweeper away from him and shame him. Tell him, shame on you. Bless God. You're the shepherd of my soul. You go get in prayer. I'll sweep this floor. You go get in prayer. I'll tell you right now, you go stay there. And when I get through sweeping this floor, I'm going in and pray for you. And then you get in there and say, God will send in people like that. This is the hardest thing in the world for me to do, was not to just run around and, and, uh, and do things. You know, most of the ministers that I know, particularly in full gospel circles, are so busy and worn down, they're worn and exhausted, they're at a frazzle, then they're doing so many things, they're scheduling and running around all over the country, doing all this kind of thing, until there is, we're about back where we started from and there's very little prayer going forth. And I've seen great churches just fold up and turn into a, just a big old dry prune somewhere. And then the next thing you know, somebody think, well, maybe we can shoot a little life back in this thing if we build a new building. Boy, you're on your way down now. You're just adding more wet wood to a fire that's about to go out. Amen? Amen. The only way you're ever going to put life in that thing 
is go get on your knees, bless God, and stay there and stay there and stay there and stay there to the point to where when you walk into that pulpit of a morning and you open your mouth, the word of God flows out your mouth and hits that congregation with an impact that just nearly uproots the pews. Now you got something. And then don't let it go. You stay there and let God begin to add to you with intercessors. And don't go to crying out for God to give you people that will pray the intercessory prayer until you start praying it yourself. That's where you're going to get the people to help you. That's where you're going to get them. You're not going to get it by making committees or anything else. Your Sunday school superintendents, Sunday school teachers, fathers of your own homes, it's the same there. Your kids are never going to help you. You and your wife will never be in anywhere kind of any kind of harmony like God's talking about until Papa begins to take his role as intercessor and begins to be pastor of that home. Then Mama will go to helping you and God will send you some little helpers that will gang up around you and they'll begin to pray and things begin to operate. Then you can begin to minister and operate. You're not having to spend quite as much time in prayer but brother you're going to have to start it there. That's where it all starts. Have you ever heard of a preacher that would walk into a pulpit some morning and say, Brethren, I didn't come here to preach this morning. Bless God, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. You're not a performer, except in the Spirit. You better be a performer there. Amen. Now, I don't care who you are or what little ability you've got or what massive ability you have. It'll be outshined by the power of the Holy Spirit and you can intercede to a place to the point to where everybody in the county will be hunting you out, wanting to know where that bunch is. I know what I'm talking about. I know. I've watched it work. I've watched it work. I've watched this bunch in our staff and office begin to pray and get in there and go to interceding and watch people call them on the telephone, drop the phone book on the floor and shut their eyes and put their finger on our name because they needed help and called them. Never heard of us. That happened, didn't it? Boys fixed to commit suicide and he said, there got to be somebody in this phone book can help me. Opened it up and closed his eyes and put his finger down there on our phone number. That's a miracle of God. And it'll never happen unless there's somebody there ready. He calls down there and whoever it was in there running the sweeper and sweeping around. What good would it done for him to call? In there painting the walls or some other something. Doing the books. It's not your job. And you folks that do your pastor that way ought to be ashamed of yourself. I'm telling you the truth. And it's time to move into an area of intercession, praise God. Some of you people that are not called in the ministry have a ministry of intercession in operation after you get through praying. God call on you and tell you, go down at that church house and relieve that pastor and his wife and let them go off and pray somewhere. Go, go down there and give the man the money and put him on an airplane and send him to Palm Springs for four or five days and let him rest and pray and seek God. And don't send him down there in a chicken house. Put him up in the Ambassador Hotel in the Biltmore or someplace and give him the comfort around him and then and, and in, and refresh his mind. And after he'd been down there about, about 24 hours, call him on the telephone and say, don't start worrying about us now. You go ahead and pray. Whatever you need, we'll see to you. We'll see to you. I'll tell you what, you get some power out of that old boy. Instead of coming around here telling me, Brother Cole, we ain't getting anything out of our church. Well, how'd you like to have three or four hundred people just sucking off the same old dry stump every Sunday morning like you? Hmm? Intercession is the key. Intercession is the key that unlocks the treasure house of the world of the Spirit, and it's available to us. It's available. Praise the Lord. It don't take years. More like moments. Moments of prayer will open up years of the blessings of God. Praise the Lord. Well, we're just about out of time here. Right, let's finish reading here what happened with Jesus. Verse 39, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. He's been dead for four days. Jesus saith unto her, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe thou shouldst see the glory of God. 
Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. <laughs> Glory to God. You see, he had some confidence in his groaning in the spirit. Now, when you get in there and you begin to pray, I, I tell you, it's good when you stand on your feet and say, Thank you, Father. I know you've heard me. And bless God, I tell you, I'm excited already. I know the results are on the way. Praise the Lord. It's going to be fun. Get to see you outshine the devil in that situation. Now, watch this. I know that thou hearest me always. First Peter 3, 12 said, His ears are open to the prayers of the righteous. Praise God. Don't you remember that? His ears are always open to our prayers. Always open to our prayers. When he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him, let him go. Now look at there. His hands and his feet were bound, and so is his face. He couldn't see. The way people buried back then, I'll tell you something right now. If, if, if you want to, it, it's just a little bit of a side excursion, but it, it, but it'll be interesting to you. In those days when people died, I guess they learned this in Egypt, they wrapped them with grave clothes and mummified them. And they poured the embalming fluid on that cloth. And it would harden. And make a, it just make a mummy. See, it made a case that that body was in. And they would leave the face open for three days. And they, they would go in there and mourn and weep inside the tomb. And the face of that person was still left bare, see. And then, then at the close of the third day, They'd lay that napkin over there and pour the embalming fluid on that and that would complete the encasement. Now, Jewish tradition of those days said that the spirit of that person would linger in the grave, in the tomb, for three days. That's the reason Jesus waited till the fourth day. They could not traditionally stand up and say, well, you know, Lazarus' spirit was still there. He was still there. He couldn't do it. He's bound to have been gone even by their traditions. He waited four days. See. They had already closed that thing off. Now, what do you think happened? <laughs> I'll tell you, you're going to have to get a hold of your seat when I tell you this. When I saw this, 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 this kind of put it to me. What do you think happened when Peter ran up in there and looked in that tomb where Jesus had laid? Now, see, they hadn't yet put that napkin on his face. They were going in there to do that. They were going in there to do that. And there that mummy laid without anybody in it. Just a hole up there where the face is supposed to be. That's straighten your day up. Huh? <laughs> Glory to God. And yet he came walking out there and said, Handle me. A spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. He came out of that, out of that burial cocoon and left it laying there and folded the napkin and laid it up on the stone. Praise God, I tell you, man, I tell you, we've whitewashed this stuff and just read it religiously until, you know, it, it got to the point where we're just now finding out what this stuff's all about, you know, and what actually happened in it. Praise the Lord. Well, you see, when Jesus spoke, the power of God was so loosed in the earth, it not only made that decayed body whole again, it healed it from whatever killed him, and then pick that case up, that mummy case. The Bible said he's bound hand and foot. He couldn't walk up to the mouth of that tomb. He couldn't walk up to the door of it. There's not any way. There was enough power to have picked him up, stood him in the mouth of that tomb, and he couldn't even see. If he could have walked, how would he ever got there? He couldn't see. That thing was solid. You couldn't walk in that thing. And Jesus said, get him out of that mess and let him go. 
Loose him. Unbind him. Get him out of that thing. But you see, the power of God was so strong to pick that body case and all up and fit it in the mouth of that tomb. Praise God. Wow! What kind of power are we talking about? We're talking about the power of the Spirit of God. The very one who is offering you life in the Spirit. Offering you His assistance. When his word says, come boldly therefore to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. And then we find in 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, where the Bible says, I will be a God to them. I, they'll be my sons and daughters and I'll be a God to them. I'll dwell in them and I will walk in them. And I will help them with their infirmities when they know not how to pray as they ought. For I will make intercession for you with groanings which cannot be uttered. And all these things will work together for those that love God and call according to my purpose. Can you hear him saying that now? Can you hear the Spirit of God inviting you into this world of power? Oh, glory to God. When I think about Satan inviting people into the power world of witchcraft, see, that's not even in the spirit world. That's a counterfeit of the world of the spirit. He's been kicked out of the world of the spirit. He can't operate there. He's working over in the psychological, intellectual, suke world of the soul, the mind. And he deceives and, and, and operates there and makes it look spiritual. Operates over there to fool men and offering, offering them power, offering them like he did Jesus, the glories of the natural world. And God's offering us the glories of the heavens praise God we're going beyond the stars hallelujah glory to God oh this kind of thing excites me mm. praise the Lord well let's stand on our feet and we'll pray